Good morning once again, beloved saints of Aea United Methodist Church. It is a beautiful day. It is a good day to gather, albeit virtually, to join in song, to join hands in praise and prayer, and to listen to the Word of God being proclaimed. Remember, we are in the season of Epiphany. Now, what does that mean? Epiphany, again, signifies the unveiling or the revealing. Epiphany is our eyes being opened to the realization that God has not left us nor abandoned us, but instead God has come down in the form of the servant king, Jesus of Nazareth. We are in the season of Epiphany, and as such, with the scriptures, together with those characters in the Bible who first encountered Jesus, we are having our eyes opened to the reality of Christ even here, right now, in our lives. This is the time where we remember the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not to be discovered or grasped intellectually or through our shrewd and dedicated, diligent hard work. No, instead, the gospel is revealed to us. Oftentimes, it is revealed to a people not even looking for it. Therefore, may you and I approach this worship service today in the spirit of celebrating the epiphany, giving thanks to God that God has chosen to reveal grace and truth to us. And why? Ultimately, because God is so good. Amen. We see in the scripture lesson for today that Jesus issues an authoritative command. Very simple. In the English, it's follow me, those two words. It is not a suggestion. It is not a good idea that Jesus one day throws out to Simon and Andrew and then later James and John, the sons of Zebedee. No, this is a command. An imperative. Simon Andrew and later James and John, they do not do anything to deserve to become disciples of Jesus. They don't earn it. They don't impress Jesus. It's not because of their aptitude. It's not because of their resume that Jesus decides to call them. No. Instead, they are chosen. They are chosen by Jesus and they are given this call. And the call is, come, come follow me. Now, one of the defining characteristics of our modern day culture, our zeitgeist as some would call it, is that we live today in a consumer-oriented mindset. In this way of viewing the world, one of the first questions that would come to mind if you or I were given such an invitation by Jesus, or if Jesus were to come today and issue similar commands to follow him, the first question that would come to mind to the modern day person would be, well, what's in it for me? What do I get out of this exchange? You want me to drop everything and follow you? Why? Whether we acknowledge it or not, so much of this mentality is even in part of the Christian culture. We look at, well, if I follow you, what will it cost me? Or better yet, as I look down a year down the road, three years, five years down the road, what will be the effect of me dropping my nets, so to speak, to follow Christ. So, we would be wise to pause here and reflect on the significance of this decision by these two sets of brothers. That they would actually heed and obey the call. When Jesus summons, they obey and they follow. These two sets of brothers, Simon, Andrew, and James, and John, it Almost sounds like a 1970s folk rock band, right? Simon, Andrew, and the sons of Zebedee. They say yes. 
they say yes to this invitation. Mark, in fact, the gospel writer, writes that both sets of brothers immediately follow Jesus. And as we reflect upon Simon, Andrew, James, and John, and their act of faith and obedience to the call, we are mindful of these things. That, number one, the call of Jesus does not hinge on our worthiness. Case in point, what exactly did Simon, Andrew, James, and John do to be worthy of this invitation to be disciples of Jesus? Not a lot. Now, as I said in the beginning, we're virtually worshiping. I cannot wait for the day that we could worship together in person and in the flesh, and on the first Sunday of the month, come and gather around the Lord's table and celebrate Holy Communion. On the day that that happens, you'll know that I'll say this common refrain, and I'll say it every time we, we celebrate Communion. Right before the time comes for the invitation for all in the congregation to come down and partake of the bread and the cup, I usually say this to the people of God. I say, listen, the host of this table and this meal, it is not Sam Nam. The host of this meal is not even Iaea United Methodist Church. The host of this meal is Jesus the risen Christ, who has offered his body and blood for the redemption of the world. And as such, Christ calls all to the table, those who would earnestly repent of their sins and seek after him. No matter what stage on this journey of faith that you may be on, if you sincerely in your heart renounce your sins and confess them freely, to come up here and receive new life in Christ, you are invited to participate in this simple meal. As we approach that table with the right mindset and the heart posture, we recognize that's important. But ultimately, preceding all of that, the right mindset and the right heart posture, preceding all of that is the invitation. And the point is, Jesus invites and calls all of us who would follow him. You may have heard this phrase before, but I'll say it. God doesn't call the qualified, but qualifies the called. This means that God is not looking for finely polished and mature people who, who look, talk, and act like super Christians. Last week, I, I used the, the phrasing, uh, special forces, disciples or Christians, right? Like there's a group of elite Christians who really do follow Jesus, and then there's the rest of us who are just your everyday, ordinary grade Christians. There, there are no such classes in God's kingdom. You don't have to be fully formed. You don't have to be a super Christian or special forces. You don't have to be a mature and seasoned disciple. Jesus calls all of us right where we are. When we read the scriptures today, we see that Jesus did exactly that. He called these four fishermen who really had no business becoming disciples. And so the question is this. That day, along the shores of the Sea of Galilee, and even today, what exactly was Jesus looking for when he decided to bring that or offer that invitation? In a word, it's faith. More specifically, perhaps, that single next step of faith. Faith enough to follow. Note that when Jesus calls Simon, Andrew, James, and John, he simply makes one promise. And this promise he makes just to Simon and Andrew. He says to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of people. That's it. The gospel author records nothing else that was promised to them. And so on one hand, Simon and Andrew, they're going to go on this adventure 
And they're going to do something familiar. It has to do with fishing, or sort of, fishers of people. But on the other hand, it's radically different from anything they have ever known. What does fishing for people even mean? But we see, as the gospel records, Simon and Andrew have faith enough to drop their nets, leave behind their career, and say, yes, Lord. It may sound simplistic, and if so, I apologize. But in a real sense, I truly believe that Jesus, even today, is looking for men and women who will have faith enough to follow, to simply take that next step of obedience, to say, yes, Lord. The tendency for many of us is, before I commit, I need more details, right? Jesus, give me your five-year strategic plan. King of kings, Lord, I would like you to give me a detailed list of mission-critical objectives to help us optimize our performance. (laughs) And maybe some of us might use more or less business lingo. But let's take just one of these individuals. Let's take Simon. Another four, we'll take Simon. What if Simon asks, Jesus, okay, I drop my nets, I get out of the boat, and I follow you, and I learn this thing called being fishers of people, whatever that means. Well, what's going to happen if I say yes? What's going to happen if I leave the boat and follow you? What do you think? Imagine if Jesus would have said this. Well, Simon, in just a little while after you follow me, we're going to go to your house. And we're going to discover that your mother-in-law, she's sick with a fever, in bed, gravely sick. I'm going to pray for her, lay hands on her, and then heal her. Shortly after that, you, your brother, and a few others, you're going to begin to follow me on this journey. We're going to go from town to town. I'm going to preach about the kingdom of God. I'm going to cast out demons. I'm going to heal the sick. I'm going to show signs and wonders that the kingdom of God is here. You're going to get excited, Simon. Your friends, they're going to get excited too. But here's the thing. In a couple of years, I'm going to ask you, well, I've been doing this for two years now. Who do the people say I am? Who do you say I am? What do you think? Simon, you're going to answer And ding, 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 you're going to say the right answer. You're going to tell me in front of the others, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then I'm going to say, well done. Upon you and the foundation of your faith, I'm going to build my church. Now, granted, you don't even know what church means, but we'll get to that. But a year later, or less than a year later, after that magnificent confession that you give to me and you've seen it all you've gone on to the mountaintop with me you've seen me transfigured my my face shining like the sun my clothes dazzling white me talking and having a conversation with Moses and Elijah you'll see all that you'll see me walking on water you'll try it too but you'll start to sink because your faith isn't quite there yet but shortly after that I'm going to get arrested. In fact, one of your closest friends will be the one to stab me in the back. And at my, after my arrest, at my trial at that kangaroo court that the religious leaders play in front of the people, some people will recognize you. In the dim light of the nighttime fire, they're going to recognize your Thank God for backups. They're going to ask you, uh, you're one of them, aren't you? You followed this man, Jesus of Nazareth. And then what are you going to do? You're going to disown me. You're going to deny that you ever knew me. After all of that journey of faith, after seeing the mountaintop, 
after proclaiming that I am the Christ, Son of the Most High God, you will disown me in front of the people three times before the rooster crows in the morning. I called it. I knew this would happen. But then I die. I rise again. You're so excited, you sprint to the tomb and find it empty. I spend a few more days and weeks with you before I ascend back up to the Father in heaven. But I entrust you and others to wait for the promised gift of the Holy Spirit. Once that happens, you will be so empowered, you're never going to fear men again. You're going to go into all the regions. You're going to take this journey to share the good news of who I am and the reality of the kingdom of God to all peoples, all tribes, all tongues. No hesitation. Much, much later, decades later, they're going to handcuff you just like they will handcuff me. And gonna, they're going to lead you to your crucifixion. But being that you felt like you didn't deserve to die in the same manner in which your Lord and Savior died, you request your executioners to hang you upside down on the cross. And there you will die a bloody, horrific, painful death. All right, Simon, what do you say? Will you sign across the dotted line and shake my hand and join me on this venture? I don't know. What would you do? What would I do? Praise be to God because it didn't unfold that way. Jesus simply said, follow me. I will make you fishers of people. And it's simply that one step, that one element of faith, faith enough to say, yes, Lord, I'll follow you. Sometimes it's not a step. Sometimes it's a leap of faith. God, I'm going to take this one next leap. I don't know what lies beyond, but I will go in obedience. Because I have enough faith just for that one leap, that one next step in this journey of following you. Beloved saints of AUMC, as you reflect upon your own life, what could that next step be? What is that next leap that Jesus is inviting you to take part in? What is that next step in following Christ that is tugging at your heart that you've had in the back of your mind for a while now, but you, you keep trying to dismiss it or get rid of it. No, no, it can't be. What is that next step of faith that our God is inviting you and I into? The simple truth is this. Every single one of us, we're all on different stages in this journey of faith that we have, that we're on. This year, the year 2021, my prayer my call and charge to the church is this. May we be a mutually supporting and loving community with no judgment. Some of us have been following Christ for decades, and we were on it. When it comes to the next step, we know, and with certainty and with faithfulness, with joyful obedience, we'll take that next step. And then we look behind us, and there are other church members that maybe are walking with trepidation. They're not leaping with joy into the next venture with Jesus, but they're kind of in the back, arms folded. Ah, I don't know, should I? Let there be no judgment. Instead, may we be a community of mutually encouraging, loving, supporting saints, sisters and brothers who will look out for each other and cheer each other on as we each make that decision to take simply the next state, next step of faith, faith enough to follow. If we were in person today, for example, at this point I would ask all of you, turn to your neighbor, look them in the eye, grab them by the hand, and say, I've got your back, friend. Why don't you do that right now, virtually? If you're on YouTube, type that in the chat box. I've got your back. Sister, I've got your back, brother. 
I hope we could do it in some form or fashion virtually. But yes, let us be the church that will support one another, love one another, journey with one another as we respond faithfully to the call of Christ. Just like on that fateful day when Jesus called these four relatively anonymous fishermen living their lives in obscurity in a small town of Galilee, yet they would become world changers. In the same fashion, let us trust that God will give us the invite. Not only the invite, God will bless us. God will give us faith enough to follow, even if it is one tiny baby step. Amen. Let us pray. God Almighty, thank you so much for your love and your grace. Thank you that you have given us the invitation, the call to follow you. And in this season of epiphany, we are praying for epiphanies to happen left and right in households all across our congregation. Young and old alike, we would be awakened to this call to step out and follow you. We pray that you would give us the grace, the grace and the faith, faith enough to follow you and to take that one next step, whatever it may be. Thank you, God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.